uh, talk I'm giving today is creating a DevOps pipeline and 11 easy steps. Uh, start off with a little bit of fun. This is one of my favorite sites when I want to have a laugh. I've got screenshots.tumblr.com. It's kind of sad. <laughs> I love this because it's like back to the future kind of look. Like this looks like 1970s or 80s or something like that. Uh, errors exist. As a QA person, I will say, please don't do your error messaging like that. I would not appreciate that. <laughs> my name's Michael Durant. Spent a lot of time on Stack Overflow. Uh, probably the proudest thing is my uh, apparent impact that Stack Overflow says I've had. Um, and on the SQA site in particular, uh, I'm number four uh, worldwide, so that's about me. I'm also available now for automation and Ruby work. I've come back from Indianapolis, where I spent a lot of the last two years watching a very old company have a lot of problems. But first, DockerCon 19, I just went to San Francisco. Um, has anyone been to, did anyone else go to DockerCon, first of all, who's here? And has anyone else been to the Moscow Center for anything? Go there. If you see a conference at the, at the Moscow Center, it is unbelievable. It's the biggest conference center I've ever seen. And I remember going there actually like 20 years ago to an Oracle conference. Uh, and being <coughs> wowed in the same way I was at this time. Um, this is, I try, it doesn't really show it, but I tried to get a, a shot of the main hall. You know, there's, there's multiple rows of seats, of tiers of seats. I mean, it, I don't know how many thousands of people it, hold, it held. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the conferences are like this now, and they really go with the music and the lights, and it's, it's like going to a rock show or something like that. Um, they really, they've kind of productionized it, like everything. So all the companies do that now. But it's a lot of fun. There's a lot, a lot of a good way for me to get up on what's going on today. And this is my message from DockerCon. Local development is dead. <clears throat> well, I don't quite mean you won't be doing any more development locally. But what I'm saying is, long way of containerization. Yeah, you're still going to be doing them on your computer. But you've got to get, if you're not into, who now is using containers? Cool, so about a third, maybe a quarter. It's, the, it's what's happening. Like you've got to get into it. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, so my challenge to you is, but where do you start, right? Like you're not using it in your company. You want to get practice. You know it's the thing of the future. So what can you do? Well, this is what I did. My challenge to myself, which I will pass on to you, is for every project, for every play app, assuming that you play around with Ruby or whatever languages you have, for every learning experience, for every hackathon, or every innovate and adapt at work, maybe, that's if they give you that time. For every project or directory you've got with a little Ruby bit of code in it, you'll think, oh, I should use containers, and you'll come up with a bunch of reasons why you can't. That'll be the, that'll be the first thing that you will encounter. You, you can't figure out how to use them. Stick with it. It, it. It's worth it. it. It's where everything's go. So figure it out. Play with it now. And do these two things that I'm about to tell you, and you will live longer, be happier, <laughs> receive gold bars. Sorry, I went off on the spam, on my spam uh, email here, and got a little bit carried away. So let's start that again. Let's do these two things. Create a Docker file for your runtime environment. Just, just do it a lot to get practice at it, is what I recommend. And Get it running in CI. For me, I love Circle CI. So for me, that means create a .circle CI directory with a config.yaml file in it. And boom, I've got something that'll run in Circle CI. The Circle CI part, like the account I have, I don't think there's like any cost to it, even though I'm doing loads and loads of different projects, which is kind of amazing. There's another area, though, where I encountered a big cost. So it's, it's kind of hit or miss. It's hard to get into containerization. This book inspired me recently, and I highly recommend that you actually don't bother reading it. <laughs> but I mean, be nice to the author. You might find this is a great book for you. What I got out of this was the title. That's it, that's it. <laughs> I mean, that, the obstacle, whatever the thing is that you're finding really hard, do more of it, you know, practice it. Like, make sure that's the thing that you can do, because it's probably the reason you're not moving forward in whatever area it is in life. So I found the one page sort of summary, you know, in the mind of that which was very helpful. It's been very helpful to me in a lot of areas of my life recently. But I give to you, and I wanted to demo this because this would be the piece that I swear a lot of folks would be like, I went to the Ruby group and I saw this one slide and 
you know, that was like the biggest value I got out of it. Unfortunately, when I was preparing today, I was checking these links and they weren't working. So I don't know if it's just down for the day. Um, feel free to take a photo. I'm gonna put the slides up as well. These will be the most two, two most useful links you've ever seen. I'll just describe it, unfortunately. This lab's got play with Docker. It brings up a screen with a, with a bunch of text and a plus button. You hit the plus button and you get a server. You hit the plus button again, you get another server. There's a little window inside the big window. You hit the plus button again, you get another. So you got three servers. They've all got like IP addresses. Now you can like play around with the swarms and orchestration and Kubernetes, all just by doing it through a browser. And this was like a lunchtime thing they did a couple of years ago at DockerCon, and then when they got it created, it was one of those, hey, we created something really cool. You know, they didn't even realize it, they were just playing around. It goes along with these slides, these, these will be available, Brett says they'll be available forever. He was a great talker, a great presenter. So if this works, you can go to these slides and it'll say, create three instances, and now like create a service mesh, now have them communicate, like the stuff you do as a DevOps engineer. You can do it like in a browser. And he gives his slides, there's a couple hundred, you know, so you really can go through and get all of this experience of working with Docker yourself at the command line. All right, does anyone here use Surface CI? All right, of course, nice. If you don't, a lot of, has anyone used, um, what's the other, Jenkins is the big one. Like, who uses Jenkins at all? I have a preference for Surface CI, and I saw that at the conference. Uh, but back to Ruby and DevOps, that's why we're here. So these are the steps, that's pretty boring. All right, so let me actually run, run you through. Now the thing is, I wanted to do this live, it was my desire to do all of this live, but every time I tr tried to do that, practiced it, something didn't work, I didn't get a confirming email, I, you know, I sign up for something, and I wait five minutes, can't, I, I can't stand in front of everyone for five minutes waiting for a confirming email, you know, that would kind of drive me crazy. So I decided, most recent time that I did this kind of hackathon thing, that I would just try and capture the screenshots. So we're gonna go through a lot of screenshots, so, Bear with me there, it's not the most exciting thing to do. But, I'm trying to do my best. All right, so creating a Slack workspace, so a lot of these things you will use, but you won't have done yourself. And you might have the impression that it's a lot to do it. Like, oh my God, I gotta create a Slack workspace. I'm gonna sign up and give identifying information and billing information and, and, and billing addresses and all sorts of crazy stuff. But they, a lot of these companies are really focusing on that how can I strip it down to the absolute smallest number of steps and screens? Um, and I think they've all done a really good job. You're gonna see that. So when you, when you go to create a new Slack workspace, it's like four screens and you're done. Bam, you've got a Slack workspace, it's kind of nice. Uh, they don't even get you all the way there because as soon as you've got this, you still have to do a couple more screens, give it a demo, give it a, give it a URL, invite some people, and then you've got a Slack workspace. It's so easy to set that up. Then of course, you're gonna have your code. So that's my uh, GitHub account. I'm gonna do new repo. Give it a name, DevOps Demo 01, public. I'm just playing around. Read me in the Ruby, git ignore. So now I got my code. And now I'm trying to do, can everyone read that? <laughs> I'm trying to do the, kind of like a, the Ruby thing where Ruby is very minimalist. So now every time I go to self environments, I wanna do the absolute bare minimum to get started. I wanna get started in, in like three minutes. So the smallest possible uh, gem file I can imagine for myself, as a, I mean, I'm a tester, is a gem, gem R spec. So I bundle that, the smallest possible test, expect true to be true. Unfortunately, I've seen tests like this in the real world, like at Sally May. There's a lot of code, but then the final assert is like true to be true. Um, so I run that test, that test runs fine. Now I'm gonna just add that code in. Now the next thing I'm gonna hook in is Jira. Who uses Jira here? Cool. Does anyone use Pivotal Tracker? The one that I used to use. What about Trello? Cool, cool. Oh, can, oh okay. <laughs> does it count if I was interning at Fact Creek when they we started making Trello. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Cool. 
all. I also do these polls, by the way, so that we can all get an, an idea of what's being used in our community. It's not just like, I want to know. So look around when, when I'm doing the questions. So JIRA is very simple. Create a project, give it a name, pick Kanban, boom. It's, it's really that easy. Uh, put a couple of tickets in, it's working. All right, now back to Slack. I want to start connecting things. So Slack has got its apps directory. If you're an admin, Git, the GitHub comes up like right there. In fact, Git, so it's all the Git related ones. There it is, install button. You just say, you want to share stuff? Yes, I do. You pick the channel, that's one thing you do, you say which channels can, can be used, and you, and you install it. So that's like the first step, you just connect GitHub, and then you actually, you want to, it, it gives you this, this, this format here. So you just enter that in Slack, slash GitHub subscribe, and you actually now are going to give the specific repo. So you get this button, you pick the, you pick the repo, and then it's hooked up there. So now, uh, the next thing I do is I do a small change and I push that. And because things are starting to get connected up now, we're going to see, in fact, yeah, I don't know if this actually needs a connection. We're going to see in, in the repo here that it recognizes that I did a push and it says, do I want to do a pull request? So I'll do a pull <coughs> request and I just merged it in myself. But now, because I've connected them, you're seeing the information in the Slack about what's going on. All right, so any questions about that? Cool. All right, so the next piece, running your actual running your, your code in the cloud, Circle CI, which I mentioned earlier, is one I love to use. One of the things I love about Circle CI is that it's um, it's kind of like its model, how it how it knows about what it's what it's going to do. It's, it's almost like it, it's like a shell because it's basically looking at your GitHub account. So you see like all of the setup projects there. You know, I've got hundreds of repos in my in my account. So most of it is controlled through GitHub. You don't actually seem to do a lot in Circle CI. You just pick the project, you pick the kind of container you want it running in, running in. I'm a Ubuntu user, so it's, this is all pretty simple for me. And it gives you a sample, a sample config.yaml file. Probably too hard to read right now, but it's it's a Ruby on Rails one that it gives you. The only one I can find that they had it includes like the bundle exec rate DB. Now I don't want those bits because I'm just doing yeah. what I was doing was just a Ruby application with no Rails piece to it. And this was the piece that, as I've experienced before, got a little bit tricky getting it right. So I had to comment out those things. And then I try to get this right, and I'm going to sort of spin through a few slides here. Oh, the other piece is you, you have to hit start building, which when you're picking all of this is like down here. So you put the circle, the dot circle CI config file, config.yaml, you put that file out there and you hit start building, and it's going. It almost seems like magic sometimes, and then boom, I've got something building. Now, this is where I'm showing you the real world. I had a lot of problems getting this working right. You know, I want to show you the polished thing, like rather than really show you the, I was banging my head against the wall for like an hour trying to get it right. You know, that's just, we've all experienced it, right? We're all developers. Um, so first of all, I got like no configuration was found. That's because I didn't have the, the, I think I had like config, but not called config.yaml. Typical thing we do, right? So that failed. Uh, then I got a, had a lot of problems with like the bundle of version. That really got very annoying. I'm um, trying to figure it out, but I had to do a gem install bundler, which I didn't think I had to do. Um, and then it suggests, I remember running into this before, it suggests that you use this, but you get an error if you use that. So there's a few, that was the hardest part, I think, of everything that I did, was, was configuring that correct, the action instructions that I want to write. I ended up with like gem install bundler, bundle, and then I went to their, I went again, it's kind of a repeat here. I went again to their demo file to see what they have a the demo thing here, to see what they did. And after a lot of fiddling around, I finally managed to get it. So these were all the attempts. Woohoo, green. 
you know, <laughs> and finally green, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that felt really good. Um, and this is what I, my final, after all of that, I didn't want to expose you to all the details of that, I ended up with, I had to do, it was quite specific, unfortunately, Jet install bundle 2.0.1, and then bundle update dash dash bundle, and then bundle install. Um, that's a little bit of work doing that. And that's because of the type of container that you chose, like at the very beginning, because you were you chose the Ubuntu one rather than the Ruby one that they provided or something? I, I was flipping between lots of the different images, okay. trying to get one that would work right. But and every the, image had its like own issues. And I can't tell you all the things that I went through, but yeah. But that's the but that's really what you get when you choose that image at the very beginning, right? Is yeah. that hopefully you get some kind of dependencies pre-installed. Exactly. So maybe this is not a pain in the neck. Exactly. And and this is where it gets very interesting, you know, with the whole containerization thing. There are uh, you'll often hear people say, Well, give me the smallest possible image. And so you hear about like these alpine images. Um, and it, de it it depends, you know, the answer to everything is it depends, right? It depends what you want and what you need. Like for me, running a really simple Ruby thing, I've got Docker files which, which take a, the Alpine image, just throw a couple of things on there. What I find is most of my stuff is RSpec running against browser. There's so many dependencies to have all of that on the machine that after a while of putting all the dependencies in, I'm like, oh, well, I should just grab the Ubuntu image. So it's gonna depend. Right. You know, it's gonna depend on what your needs are. The other great thing, I'm kind of going off containerization, but I don't, that's okay. Um, is the whole the way that the way that Docker Docker that I've seen the example of containerization the way it caches. I mean, yeah, that first pull, you're gonna you know you might have to wait one minute. And the DockerCon, everyone trying to do it locally on their machine. Oh my God, it's like completely the network just like froze. <laughs> um, but once you've pulled that image down at the beginning of your workday, the Ubuntu image is probably not going to change. So every time you go build at that point, boom. Just use cache. So that's that's I love the technology the way it's been put together like that. So yeah, I had to fiddle around with a few different images to try to get one that would do what I want. I think it's I think I hit a period of time right now where there's 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 several issues going on with versions. I think in a couple of months it'll actually smooth out a little bit. Um, there were some things that were just conflicting. Ah, but this says this, this says this. Uh, stack overflow a lot. <laughs> um, so there's a couple more integrations. Um, we've got Circle CI working and running, but we can actually install uh, a connection here in Slack and have it post in general. There's always a lot of different opinions on where you should have your notifications going in Slack. Some people like it in the same channel, some people like a separate channel. I'm the same channel because I want the humans and the bots to be talking together. Um, but you have different opinions on that. It also depends on how wordy it is. When I've used like the Microsoft VSTS, you don't have a lot of control and every message is like this long. So I might want to shove that in a separate channel so that I don't just lose all the human chat. And you just pick your project, hit that little thing. Here's where you get the, the integration URL. Put it in there. And from CircleCI, I'll give you that. And then boom, you've connected the two. Yes, I've connected them. And one of the nice things that Slack has started to do now, I don't know when they started to do this, but they put their apps right there in the navigation mm -hmm. pane. So like, and you, and you can click on them and configure them. And you used to have to go through all those menus before, it's like an admin, so that's kind of cool. Um, Jira also on the Slack side has a connector, so you install that, give it the authorized, Say yes. Now Jira's connected to the Slack as well. You can see that there. And then, then you have to actually connect your project. But it gives it to you as drop downs, you know. I mean, this is so easy, it really is. So I picked my uh, DevOps demo, this particular one. And it said you've connected it. And so now, and it says, yep, you've got a project subscription. And now, when you actually do things in Jira, you'll get um, Slack notifications. And here's an here's example. So I did like some tickets just to play around. And this is why I was saying, like compared to say BSTS, this is fairly small. I think that's kind of nice, just three lines. BSTS ones are 15 lines long. <laughs> Too much. All right. And then the I think the point of this was the thing about 
um, when, you're, when you're hooking in JIRA, those of you that will know, you want to use the, the JIRA ticket number, for want of a better term, uh, DD-2, that will, and that will, that will be recognized, that will connect things up. Um, so here, I pushed a tiny change, a one character change, shows that pull request into GitHub. So I merge, this might be a repeat. But here, now you can see in, um, in Slack, these are the two configurations that we have. And you can see there's a lot of choices here. You can pick the repos that, are, that you're uh, connecting. So this is just basically, it's a little bit hard to see. It is basically just a, after I've done all of those connections, this is like what's going on in Slack on a, on a given day. We've got, we've got Jira tickets, we've got Circle CI, we've got GitHub pull requests. This is, and this is why I like it all in one place. You know, imagine conversations going on you know, through various <laughs> steps as well. And then, It'll show you uh, this is Circle CI. This was my minimal spec helper. Um, as small as I could get spec helper to be, just to run something that was Selenium going against an external server. That's why I said run server is false. This was the final. Um, Image that I've got. They have a nice Circle CI have a nice one where they go dash browsers, and it gives you the image with the browser. It's like Firefox and Chrome, all the different browsers on it. So I was like, yeah, that's nice. It takes away that whole process of installing those. And then here's what it looks like when I've got things that are that are passing. I've got various tickets that I've been working on here, merging into master, uh, and everything's going green. This is within Circle CI. You set up the notifications, and the default is <laughs> the default is get an email every time a build on a branch I push fail. So I, well, like I use Slack, so I turn that off. <laughs> it's nice to have control when you have your own projects, isn't it? So up until this point, I was able to do all of this on my own, sort of you know, soloing it, using my own personal GitHub account and all of that. But I got a group of folks that I've worked with that I'm still in touch with, that I do still code with and do fun with things. I do teaching with them, we do little practice sessions. And so I wanted to expose them to this as well. And in trying to do that, I can't remember the exact thing, it was something around collaboration, GitHub, maybe Circle CI, doing it as an individual, I couldn't do what I needed to do. And I needed to do what everyone who works in a company does is have an organizational account. So at that point, I had to actually go ahead in GitHub, start in GitHub, and create this organizational account, which I called um, Ultimate Weather. So I had this idea of doing very simple weather screens. This weather.com is like driving crazy, right? So at that point, um, I needed to create an actual organization. And here I'm adding, I'm adding people in. That's when it's private. That's when it's me. Oh, this was sorry, jumping around a little bit. This is the webhook for Circle CI. And all the choices. Okay. That was all like one evening. So all hooked up. Do a ticket. Notifies everywhere. That's great. And then I did a bit more work on it. A few days went by, and this is kind of where it's got to. I'm, I'm kind of forwarding you in time now a little bit to avoid watching me to make all of those little individual changes. This is what my Docker file now looks like. Well, I kind of missed out. The thing I wanted to show you right at the beginning was a Docker file could literally just be that line from Ubuntu 1804. And then you could do Docker build and Docker run, and you could go right into a Docker environment with one, one little line in there. In your Docker file. But here's me, for instance, copying in all my aliases in. So I've got my aliases and my functions and all that fun stuff. Um, installing Git and Vim and Ruby. Um, this is what it ended up looking. Oh, and, and you often find as you start 
needing things like capybara and and, um, and web driver and stuff that you need like Ruby Dev to run into that a lot. Spec helper. Uh, it's got a little bit longer. Remember that <laughs> big one I showed you that was pretty short. Um, this deals with the different browsers like Chrome and Firefox. This is browser stack. Anyone who uses browser stack is used to having that chunk of stuff in there. And then there's a little thing down here for screenshots. You know, that's a sliding in capability. So what I was saying just now was I needed an organization. So I created, and it's free of course, like most of this stuff, this organization called Ultimate Weather. It's now got these like play around um, repos within it. And again, because I had collaborators, I really, I really found that I needed to have an organization eventually. And then in Circle CI, that drop down menu, which before was my private account, now also has the, I can't remember if I had to add it or however, I now have the, the two. I can switch between my private account and my organizational account. <coughs> and this was the plan I had to go with Slack. So it's costing me you know, a whole $7 a month for like four or five people. Uh, given our profession, I don't consider that really a cost. And then I was like, okay, we got a lot of stuff going, but I'm on Linux. I can't test IE. I know I've got to be able to test IE in the real world because my boss is going to be asking me for it. So I hooked up Browser Stack. I don't think I've got all the screens that I went through. I've tried to just kind of say, like the other ones, you sign up, you hook it up, you connect it up, it's a couple of screens, it tells you what to do. And here we have a test I wrote that goes to W3C, completing, so it says, you know, does this page exist? Um, this was the one cost piece that I got. Like they had a free thing and I ran it like three times and I was out of, I was out of my free plan. So I signed up, and this ended up being like 160 bucks a month. You know, I mean, I ran it, you know, like 200 times. So that was the one area, and I was like, you know, I'll, just, I'll do it for a month, and then I'll just kill the account. And it's a small cost in the big scheme of things. So that was the one area I'll just, I'll just throw out there where there is like some serious cost involved. Yes. It might be worth pointing out. I believe at some point Microsoft released virtual machine images specifically for people to use to test Internet Explorer using whatever operating system can run those virtual machine images. Provided, of course, you have enough gigabytes of storage for the, the images, etc. Right. So one might find a service more convenient. Right, right. And that's a big thing with containers too, because they're really, you know, they're, they're filling in, in in a similar space as like VMs. Um, containers are found to be much more lightweight than VMs a lot easier to, to spin one up with, with your particular configuration. Um, yeah, Microsoft doing everything to try to get into the game, you know, the whole Linux support and all of that. They're trying, they're doing a lot better than they used to be, that's for sure. And then the other thing I wanted to add in was code, who use code climate, anyone here? Does anyone else use any other kind of code quality tool? Just out of your world, what is that? Uh, courtesy. What is it? Codacy. Codacy. Yeah, it's, it's like a Palm competitor, I guess. Oh, okay. Oh. What? Uh, well, ESLint for Java for JavaScript. Right. So yeah, I've used I've used Code Climate at one place before, and I, and I like it here. We can see, um, you know, it's getting it's getting fussy about the Ruby stuff, you know, spaces and things like that, double quotes, single quotes. It's definitely nice to have. A little bit more readable, like <coughs> a couple of those things. <coughs> and then there's one more integration configuration I missed, which was it gets a bit confusing after a while. That's why I have that slide with all those steps. If you actually wanted to do this, you would actually use that slide to kind of guide you in your particular thing. Uh, but this was the Jira GitHub one uh, within Jira. You, and so here I've got my two organizations, well, my organization and my personal account. So I pick the organization and then it creates this. I think it's like one screen if you press like return on. Um, so that, that created that connection there. So now in Ultimate Weather and GitHub, it's got this Jira all set up. 
and then this is what it looks like once you've connected the, 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 the two parts up, like JIRA knows about your branches and your commits. So now I'm working in Ultimate Weather, in this thing called Ultimate Weather Ruby. I'm doing another pull request. And I can see the pull request here um, in, in, in JIRA. So they're all talking to each other. One thing I'll throw out there, somewhat related to all of this, has anyone here tried editing workflows in JIRA? And you smile when I ask. You all smile. You're like, oh my god. Wasn't that crazy? It's just nuts. It's nuts. So it's just a warning for anyone who doesn't use it. This is where you will like, oh my god, the world's like really cruel. It, it basically <laughs> you has have to these be an things. Administrator. Like, you if you sorry. And you have to be an administrator. Of course, that's the which worst is thing. like the the freaking <sighs> worst freaking thing. Though, who wants to give anybody else administrator on the Jira <laughs> server when there's like 500 production projects on it right. and the workflow totally bring down another project because they're all using the same so, workflow. So then everyone's like, don't make them administrators. Yeah. And so this, this situation comes Visible. about. Whereas in fact, as with most things, everyone needs to be an admin. Everyone needs to understand. Everyone needs to suffer. I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> But it has, it's, it's always had this way, and I remember, I remember from like three years ago when I learned to do this, I remember like, oh God, this was the crazy thing, right? I got better at it, as with most things, after a lot of time and then trying it again. But there's a few things, it's hard to describe, but if you've got a workflow and you want to change it, you can't, because it's published and it's live. So you've got to make a copy of it, and then you can change it, but it's not the workflow that you're seeing. So then you've got to publish that, and, and that's just, a third of it maybe there's like three or four different things like that that will have you and what usually happens is you think you've got it and maybe like you say to the team hey it's all good and then they go to the board and the tickets aren't there <laughs> right you had that again when I had that experience it is terrifying so the phone or whatever communicate slack goes off hey we can't see our tickets and so <coughs> the only way I learned it was, was practice I didn't I've never found a really good you know, from the company or anyone else, a really good way for me to get that knowledge of what's really going on and why am I getting these weird errors. You can get around it, but I think for, for, forewarned is forearmed, is, is the expression there. Just be, just be aware that it's kind of tricky when you're doing Jira workflows. Um, there it is, the Jira board for Ultimate Weather. This was what you do, just to touch on it very quickly, when you go to do this workflow change thing. Well, first of all, I mean, when you click here, like if you hadn't done it before, would you, you'd probably click this or this. You might not click this. This is the key thing. You know? <laughs> it's just like hidden away out there, right? That. Yeah, and then you kind of go, whoa, what is all of this? It takes a little while to come back from the first time you see it, literally, getting used to what, those, what these are. You start to get the hang of it from playing around with it. Like, okay, they give you this one here. It's kind of what I'm using. Um, and I made a copy of it, and I called it this. And I, I put in these pieces. There's another piece, though, that's like with a copy of it. Now I got the copy. Then, this is like all the screens I have. I'm not even going to go through them all, there are just like too many screens to go through. Publish it. <coughs> then you have to deal with this diagram as well. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought I just did all that mapping of statuses and everything like that. So I added in the, uh, the code review, the code review thing there. Not, not, not the easiest thing. But, get through that, I even, I even warned about those. You go through all of this, and in a few hours, or maybe in under an hour if you've done it more than once, you've got a CI, continuous integration, maybe CD, I don't, I don't like lumping the two of them together, even though I have here. But you've got continuous integration going on every time you push. You've got your control environment through Docker. Um, deployment, I'll skip on that. You've got code linting and reviews, you've got code quality going on. You've got browser stack for multi-device multi browser testing. You've got Slack, which is integrating all of it. And you've got Jira, which is doing the task 
the workflow management. Um, and then I, I kind of like to throw the, the final screen up there of that's what it looks like when you've got all these pieces here and people will often set up their one or two or three monitors to kind of have all this stuff. You know, here's, here's your heart, right? <laughs> that's my heart anyway, my terminal window. But you can see we've got Surface CI, Jira, Slack, and uh, GitHub. And I didn't even realize that I didn't show and I added them on as text, like Browse Stack and Code Climate. So all of those tools working together to run your code. 